The way that search is actually implemented by major search providers requires all of these different machines. You might wonder, why not just build one really super huge powerful machine and do all of the crawling, all of the indexing, all of the responding to queries on that one big machine? Because to some degree, some of the complexities of implementing a real search engine come from having to manage this huge collection of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of machines that are all participating in finding things online, building in the indexes, and actually responding to queries as they come in. So, the question is, you know, why not just build one big computer and do this in a much more simple way? So there's a couple of reasons that it's not done this way. Um, and those reasons have to do with some fairly interesting hardware limitations. So the first thing you might have noticed is at some point, um, processors stopped getting faster. And this is something that we refer to as the end of Moore's Law scaling. So there was a period of time, and maybe you were born after this period of time kind of ended, but where successive processor generations got faster and faster and faster and faster. And at some point, that stopped. And the reason was, the, as the processors got faster, what was actually happening is we were packing more and more transistors into a smaller and smaller area. And unfortunately, those transistors generate heat. And at some point, if you put enough of them so close together, those chips get really, 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 really hot. So if you ever had like an old Pentium 4 computer, the heat sink on that thing was about a foot tall. And the reason was it was a single chip, but the process density was so high that that chip got really, 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 really hot when it was running. And that was a problem. You think about trying to put a chip like that on a smartphone where I can't put a foot um, you know, tall heat sink and this thing can't get that hot. So at some point, what happened is we went from one really fast processor um, to multiple processors. And this is why your computer now, even your smartphone, probably has multiple processors. And so one of the things that happened is, you know, rather than being able, and this makes things a little bit more complicated from a programming perspective already, even to program one machine. Now, once you have multiple processors, you might ask, well, why can't I build a machine with like 128 or 1,024 or a million processors to just make this huge machine and have it have petabytes worth of memory and, you know, exabytes worth of storage? And the reason is, at some level, um, once you have multiple processors, making memory look coherent to all of them starts to become very, very challenging. And coherent memory is one of the foundations of the programming model that we're used to as programmers. That's kind of what it means to think about programming a single machine, is that shared memory that's accessed by all these processors um, stores the latest value of things. And this is something that you might learn about more when you learn about hardware. So the problem is, at some point, when you start to program a machine that has too many processors, it starts to be equivalent to kind of programming multiple machines. So that's the sort of the hardware story. Now, there are some other reasons that using warehouses full of computers to do search is also a little bit more effective than having one big computer. And those reasons have to do with cost and fault tolerance. So the cost to building one really complex machine tends to actually be more than the equivalent cost of buying lots of simpler machines and assembling them into one uh, big, big sort of multiple machine array. Um, and this is something that we've seen over and over again as a lesson in computer science. It comes out when we build disk arrays. It comes out when we build data centers. Building a big, powerful thing from simpler parts actually turns out to be cheaper. Um, and the reason that building one complex thing is much more expensive, the cost to build something that's complex sort of goes up exponentially, whereas the cost to build something simple and then just buy a bunch of those things scales more linearly. Now that does create this challenge of having to manage all these machines, so that's, and, and, and that's something that's fair, right? That's, that's a trade-off. The other interesting thing is fault tolerance. So the computers in the big data centers that are run by major companies that provide search as a feature online, those companies manage hundreds of thousands of machines. And those machines fail all the time. But you never notice it. Probably since we started this video, there have been multiple machines in data centers across the world run by Microsoft, Amazon, and Google that just died. They had a failure, a hardware fault, a disk drive broke, and those machines are dead. 
they will never come back. They're going to be pulled out of a rack, you know, take it to electronic recycling, and a new machine is going to be put back in. And by building search across these distributed machines and other services across these arrays of distributed machines, it allows us to handle these failures. Think about it. If you have one big complicated machine that's doing all of your search, if that machine fails, then search is down. Search doesn't work until you can bring that machine back online. In contrast, if I have thousands of machines that are doing search, and if I design those, the software that runs on those machines effectively, you never even notice this. And trust me, the emails that you store in the cloud, the documents that you store in the cloud, the music that you listen to in the cloud, all of that has been stored on machines that have failed. And those failures have, have never appeared to you because we've gotten very good at building reliable systems on top of unreliable parts. Think about it again. In the time that we've been talking, multiple machines across the world have failed never to come back again, and yet the services that run on top of them have not failed. And in some cases, there's been even no loss in availability. So, you know, there are a lot of advantages. I mean, there's some clear limitations to the hardware that prevent us from building a computer that's big enough to search, index, and, um, you know, uh, trawl the entire web. But there's also some really compelling and interesting design choices that make it more effective and more reliable to build search and other high availability features on top of huge numbers of unreliable machines.